thoughts expressed may not be that of MCM Productions. Present Music is an organization that specializes in performing new music, music of our time, by living composers. What we do with Present Music varies from funny things to clever things to wild things. And I think that Jerome's piece, which is going to be political in nature, environmental in nature, um, obviously our, you know, cultural in nature, brings together a lot of very important elements that actually relate to our present day. And so I think sometimes it's, it's almost the stronger way to get deeply into something that affects our lives currently to think about it through a story. And I think this story, it's, um, you know, it, it, he's starting way back, prehistoric time, all the way up until the present day. So it's very, you know, incorporates a lot of things and I think that if the people can come away from the experience hopefully getting deep into the music that's the first thing but that when they leave they really have some some things to think about here and how what they see and hear uh, at this concert relates to their lives now. Hey, America! I've been wanting to do this piece for over 15 years. The primary thing that got me interested were the numbers. What? I was fascinated by what it took in a very short period of time. Haunts to reduce something, in this case, the bison, from those large numbers down to practically none. You. There were bison all over the uh, country at one time, except I think in a couple states in New England, so which is surprising that there were up along and down the East Coast uh, and in Kentucky, and, and they were pushed pushed back gradually, and they were you know killed by settlers and used for meat. And after the Civil War, there was a great deal of unemployment. A lot of men who had been soldiers went out to the West and became buffalo shooters, buffalo hunters, and and so on. So it, there, there were a whole a whole series of events that that piled up on each other after the years of um, ex extermination, essentially, it went down to under a, under a thousand individual bison. So. And on, at some estimates, as low as 350, 400 yeah. <clears throat> animals remaining in the late uh, 19th century. There did come a time, and there are a number of quotes that are quite startling about uh, talking about specifically killing off the bison herd as a way to subjugate the Indian people further and, and more quickly and, and efficiently. Uh, and, and a lot of the guys who, who went out there to do that were, you know, per perhaps oblivious to all of those, um, all, all of those motivations and so on, but they were making a lot of money and we, and they, um, we, there is one, one quote that, that tells that a, um, you know, a hide dealer made more money than the President of the United States <laughs> in a particular year. <laughs> so it, you know, it's the sort of, it was the kind of, uh, you know, dot com of the <laughs> 18, 1860s to the 1880s, if you want to say it that way. 
and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm an American and I love this country, but it's part and parcel of what happened here, and not only with the Indians, but of course with the, the people who were brought from Africa and, and enslaved. And we still, I, ju I just feel that it hasn't been examined enough. And, you know, it was, it's hard to examine it if, as a kid in school, you're never even told about it. Um, and maybe if we, if we really start to examine it more, um, we'll, 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 we'll grow up thinking about things in a different way. Well, one way to perhaps be a, a better American, which there's a lot of talk about striving to be the best we can be and all that, would be to have a clearer understanding of how America came to be what it is vis-a-vis -vis how it treated the landscape yeah. and the animals and the people that were in it when they started to expand westward. Um, and I think for me as an individual, I became I had to feel more solid as whatever it meant to be an American 20 some years ago when I started to look into a lot of these issues, not just by reading books, but by by going to Indian country, for instance, and talking to people and, and hearing stories. And, and I've heard stories that I don't think you can find in books. And, uh, and that, that made me feel more understanding of what it meant to be an American and to live on this landscape. Travel back, crossing eastward flowing Saskatchewan, the Missouri again, Platte, the Arkansas, the Red. Any place we walk in this brilliance of rivers of drainage, really, we walk in a great moving circle of the grasses they nourish, and we will walk forever. It, I, th I think for an artist, whatever emotional content is coming in, in addition to all the research and, and you know, the, the chance things that happen in the places you go and all that, there's this, this kind of open net, and at a certain point, Unfortunately, because there's a deadline, the net has to close. For me, whatever piece I wrote is a kind of uh, capturing of a certain period of time in life. And what's happened in, in, in my life and yours too, I think, is there's been a lot of loss, and I mean, possibly because of our age, there's been a lot of loss and death um, and uh, ending of, uh, uh, ending of ways of living that, that uh, I had known for a long time. So it, it, it's, it's in a tiny, small way um, the human experience of what happened um, in, this, in this time when the bison were exterminated to, to people whose entire way of life disappeared. And you know, who do you, who are you then? Aside from, of course, talking about the subject matter over and over and sharing ideas about it, we, had, we then at one point had to decide how are we going to present this material in a meaningful way. Um, and I had this idea, and I've never done this as a composer, uh, I wanted to write this piece in what's called a rondo form. And what a rondo form is, is that there's a statement of a theme, da -da 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 -da, and then there's another section of different material, and then that first theme comes back and then there's other material, and then the first thing comes back again. Part of the scoring for the work, there are 28 people that are in what I'm calling the herd, or the sound effects chorus. Each of those people will have two stones, so that's 56 stones total. Uh, and at various times in this, the scoring of the piece, they will play them by hitting them together like that. Uh, I should add that the reason there are 28 people in this group, it's symbolism. There are 28 rib bones in a bison. And then the number 28 comes up in other ways too, but so that's why I just wanted to illustrate why I chose that number. Uh, so scoring for them, it, it's, it would seem like a strange thing to do, but you can notate it uh, like you notate a drum part, rhythmically, like da, 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 would be quarter, two eighths, quarter, two eighths. So it's not that strange. Uh, what will be strange is the sound of 56 of them being hit together. Uh, I have been given the comment a lot over the years about my music that it does seem to, to have an expansive quality to it, a, a feeling of great open spaces. 
in a loose way, of course, the bison that we're dealing with in terms of where they were during the time of the slaughter with wide open spaces of the, of the Great Plains. Uh, but the thing I can do musically, uh, more specifically, is to try and support and illuminate through sound the language that Kathleen is coming up with and the ideas she's putting forth and the uh, sometimes the what might seem like the mundane facts and figures of this story but what's interesting is that those facts and figures they're not mundane at all they're really the core of what got me started as I said earlier in they wanting sing. to do this piece. They sing yeah. and, and, and that's true of any any piece that you work on that's comes from non nonfiction you, 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 the truth sings whether you're talking about the number of bison there were or the number of different grasses that there were in the tall prairie land, for instance, which do not exist anymore except in very tiny places, or in, believe it or not, interestingly enough, in cemeteries dotted all over the, the plains, where of course it's illegal to mess with the vegetation. It's, it's not a piece that's going to offer concrete solutions, but I think like any piece of artwork that deals, as Kathleen said, uh, with source material in fact and in history, if you tell a story in a full and meaningful fashion, it will give the audience, imbue the audience with some sense of wonder, uh, and that can occur within the framework of an art piece just in a matter of seconds where something is sung or spoken that really startles an audience member. Well, the, the piece, actually a good section, of, uh, a section of it toward the end, talks about the saving of the bison and the resurrection of the bison, so to speak, and that certainly ties into the Indian nations primarily, but also many other people, not Indians, who are participating in the saving of the bison and the resurrection of it. Um, also, I think the piece, as we talked, alluded to before, if it works well, it does help affirm your own individual sense of what it means to be alive and living on this American dirt. When I choose uh, venues for concerts, um, there are a lot of things that go into that decision. One is acoustics, one is does the place sort of feel and have a history that connects to the subject matter of that concert. So we've done concerts for instance, at the zoo, where it uh, focused on, you know, uh, animals and, and nature. We've done concerts at Discovery World, where it focused on technology. So when I knew that Jerome is doing this piece, um, I knew that uh, there was a strong connection between Native American culture and ecology, and I was you know, trying to find a place where these two things sort of came together. And so when I went to the school for the first time, I saw, I saw um, this incredible building that is made out of natural materials. It's set in this beautiful prairie setting and uh, architecturally really interesting. Well, the reason for wanting not so much a rural setting, but a pastoral setting or a traditional setting, someplace where someone didn't lay waste to the land, uh, was because these urban children have now become multi-generational urban children and often don't have a connection to their ancestral homes. And although those places are often called reservations now uh, and perhaps aren't the original ancestral homes of the tribes in the state of Wisconsin, for example, they're still what we consider homes and they have lakes and they have rivers and they have trees and they have rock formations and forests and all kinds of things that those of us who grew up with those benefits um, um, use to define ourselves as you know, people of nature, not, not really people of, of, of urban areas. So um, these children just have not had the opportunity. Their prior location was one that was chain link fences and streets and protection from the outside. Uh, and this, this location was a place that when we looked at it from all angles and in, including above it, it looked like what we know to be our ancestral homes. When you want to make something that is 
new. It's never existed before. A building that reflects an Eastern woodland Indian aesthetic ideal, reflecting its culture and its values. Um, it's very, very difficult to put that into words. I would imagine that would be true of anything that has ever been made for the first time that's coming from feelings within a person as opposed to saying, please just copy that, or we like elements of this and elements of that, so just put it together. Eventually, we interviewed a number of architects, including Antoine Predak, and when we started talking about nature and land and unobtrusive but yet beautiful, um, he was able to start describing things using words that somehow gave voice to the feelings. So he's almost lyrical with the way that he can put things in words where, um, like feelings are lyrical, they sing to you when they're happy feelings. And so during the interview process, it became very clear that this man was, was speaking the language that we felt and allowed us to start speaking in the same lexicon. Because of the desire for authenticity in those cultural elements of the design, uh, actually expressing Eastern woodland culture, we asked him to bring on a um, collaborating architect. We became aware of someone that we, wh whom we recommended to um, Antoine, and that was Chris Cornelius. He was working at the University of Virginia at the time, and we became aware that he was becoming a rising star in the field of architecture in general. So we were very excited about the fact that rather than having an Indian architect, we were going to be able to refer an architect who was in India. My role on the project is really as a kind of cultural translator. Um, I was asked to be a part of the project to help to maintain the cultural authenticity uh, with Antoine Predock and for him to uh, get an insight into the culture that he was dealing with. And um, it was important to me that the cultural values be translated in the architecture, that the architecture kind of exude uh, cultural values that are timeless but in a contemporary building, uh, a building that looks like it was built in the the 21st century. You know, there's a, a library here that has a, a, a great collection of, of cultural books, but the, the students and community access to technology is here as well. The, the placement of the room in the building itself, it's really in the core uh, where everything kind of comes together, where school and community actually meet. Um, we, picked and selected furnishings that are more uh, natural in nature. The things that we're sitting on are like uh, pebbles that you would find in a creek or a river. A lot of the materials in, in, the, in the library are uh, ones that you can touch, like the end caps um, of the bookshelves are all leather. Um, they're intended to be durable, and show wear. Uh, culturally, it's uh, important for us to traditionally have used uh, all of the animal that, um, that had been uh, consumed or used for sustenance. Um, so uh, that's why we, we kind of use it here. Uh, but mostly it's, it's about uh, having different textures, uh, things that people engage, uh, they'll touch, they'll sit on, they'll use. Um, all of those materials are things that are kind of uh, have a tactile sense to them. This is the Earth the Sky Stair. This is a significant space because it's a, the connection between the elementary grades and the middle school grades. Um, those two levels of student actually have a kind of mentor uh, relationship. The, the older students actually mentor the younger students and we saw that this, this connection is being important because it's a kind of rite of passage uh, that students go from this level to that level. This is the, the sky, um, the element that uh, shows us where the sky is. The elements in the floor here are, are in orientation, north, south, east, west. Any of the round spaces within the building have that uh, orientation and then these bronze tiles actually map out the locations of the homelands or reservations of all of 11 of the Wis uh, Wisconsin uh, Indian tribes. The, the concrete stair um, is a self-supporting stair, so it creates a kind of bridge. It's not really attached to the walls at all. Uh, it's, it's integrally colored concrete, 
And the way that Antoine Predock likes to do concrete is in a very sort of natural way so that the concrete actually has imperfections in it, it has dimples of where air pockets were uh, when it was poured. You can see the formwork. Um, so uh, he, it is his intention for it to be very natural. The number one most important thing that Antoine and I uh, got out of their design vision statement was its connection with nature. And so some of the, the tree columns um, actually come from the Menominee Forest uh, up in northern Wisconsin. Uh, copper is always something that's been indigenous to Wisconsin, so it's been used by the American Indian cultures of Wisconsin in, in different ways. Uh, and uh, wood is, is, is important because most of these cultures come from a woodland uh, landscape. And then the stone emerges out of the earth in different ways um, in Wisconsin as well. It's amazing to me that I've gone through so many stages of this building, um, from finding an architect to then describing the program, what would happen in the building, so therefore knowing what kind of spaces were needed, then thinking about the logic of the spaces and all the things that eventually result in what is the first image of design and of course the first image of design that I saw were a few elevations but eventually the model and you get a feeling about that and then the feeling is boy that's right but now that I see that the building is here it's actual right. it's on the land my purpose for, uh, for doing this has come to fruition and I feel like it was a really a noble worthwhile purpose because I think it's going to serve people that I care about and for so many generations that I can't count them. We know what it's going to take for these children to get where they're going is a connection to culture, to family. This is a place for families. Right. It's a place for families to relate to other families to become a larger family. It's called a community. So we're very excited that this place exists, not just as housing, but beautiful, beautiful art in and of itself. This is the way told to me. Now, walk with me across the North American prairie 600 years ago, where the tall, the mixed, and the short grasses make for the sun between the rungs of a vast ladder of rivers till we pass into the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Climb the ladder roughly west and north, calling the names the waters come to be called. Mississippi, Missouri, Niobrara, Cheyenne, the Yellowstone, the Milk, up to the Bow in Alberta. Descend again on the Bighorn, the North and South Platts, the Colorado, the Republican, the Kansas, the Osage, the Cimarron, the Canadian, the Rio Grande, the Pecos, the Brazos. Travel back, crossing eastward flowing Saskatchewan, the Missouri again, Platte, the Arkansas, the Red, any place we walk in this brilliance of rivers of drainage, really, we walk in a great moving circle of the grasses they nourish. And we will walk forever toward the call of each earthly creature's inborn need for space. So much space. So much grass will take all of time or so we come to think. Truly, it is the grassland. This program was made by a volunteer producer using the equipment and facilities at Mata Community Media.